This uh, next video is looking at a bit more detail about insulin release and glucose uptake um, and therefore it's obviously also dealing with blood glucose following a meal. So just a um, reminder of what happens to glucose after a meal. So you can see here this green arrow, in fact the green arrows that are shown everywhere are indicating what happens to glucose after a meal. And the red is indicating what happens with the action of insulin, okay? So um, firstly, glucose is, um, is basically being absorbed from the gut into the bloodstream. So it will be um, distributed. This here, I believe, is meant to be an artery. It's a slightly wonky-looking artery. Um, but it distributes that glucose through the blood, bloodstream to the brain and the central nervous system, to other cells like red blood cells and immune cells, into our muscles and down to fat cells as well. While this is happening, remember that an increasing level of glucose will stimulate um, insulin to be released from the beta cells within the islets of Langerhan. The insulin will then go on to have an effect on the liver. And if you remember, that means that glucose will be taken up and converted from glucose into glycogen. It will also be distributed throughout the blood system. It actually doesn't, um, insulin doesn't it have an effect on the brain in itself, and we'll look at that in just a second. Um, but insulin will have an, an action on muscles and also on fat cells. So let's start um, looking at the beta cells and how insulin is actually released from them. So this diagram, which we're going to be um, looking at further in the next few slides, this here is showing you um, the plasma membrane. And in this case, it's actually the plasma membrane of a beta cell itself within the islet of Langerhan. This is outside the cell and this is inside the cell down here. Um, these little green hexagons are representing glucose. There is a little protein channel in here. Now this is not a receptor, um, so please don't call it that. It is actually a transporter molecule, just like we talk, you know, think back to last year and we're talking about these proteins that are um, able to transport molecules through them. So this is a glucose transporter, and for short they actually get called GLUTs, so G-L-U-T. I'll show you a bit more about that um, in the next couple of slides. Basically, um, when glucose levels increase, we need to have a really rapid release of insulin so that we don't get a buildup of glucose in our bloodstream for too long. But um, and basically, this means that we, within a few minutes, a very short period of time, we need to get a large amount of insulin being released. However, thinking back to last year and thinking back to gene expression and the fact that you need to basically turn genes on and then go through the process of protein synthesis and produce the insulin because insulin is a protein-based hormone. It actually takes about half, half an hour to an hour to get the insulin gene being switched on and to make more of this um, insulin protein, this insulin hormone to be produced. This is much too slow for the action that we need to reduce glucose in the bloodstream. And so what happens is that these beta cells um, actually sort of um, go, go ahead of themselves and they make insulin in advance and they keep it packaged up in these little things called vesicles, which you may remember back to last year as well, in particular talking about endocytosis and exocytosis, um, where these double-layered plasma um, contained vesicles or little circles of membrane um, will actually go up, and we'll see this on the next slide, and they actually release the contents of, their ves of the vesicle. So this is this process of exocytosis. But the good thing about this is that it means that these little red squares, which, which are representing insulin, are prepackaged, and they're just waiting for blood glucose to increase so they can be released. This whole process makes this a much more efficient, effective um, response to, to increase blood glucose. Okay, so um, this extra glucose that is coming into the cell through the glucose transporter triggers the beta cell um, to get this vesicle containing insulin to move up to the plasma membrane. It will fuse with it and it is then going to release the contents of the vesicle, in other words, insulin, into the bloodstream. So you can see it here um, releasing. You can also see over here that the glucose is moving through the transporter into the cell. 
um, and that is triggering this release of insulin out into the blood system. So once again, this is um, basically just a really effective way of causing release of insulin from the beta cells to make sure that it is as rapid and effective as possible. Let's look at um, sort of the, the effects of releasing insulin now. Um, so firstly, we're going to look at glucose uptake in the brain. Okay, And once again, we can see this diagram. It is also representing outside the cell and inside the cell. But now this is representing either a brain cell or some kind of um, nervous cell um, that is going to be taking up glucose. These green hexagons are still glucose. And now we've got um, a slightly different protein in the plasma membrane. It still serves the same purpose, but it's just a different color to show you that it, it kind of has a different action. So these are also not receptors, but they are glucose transporters. Okay, So otherwise known as glucose protein channels but they will transport glucose ac across this membrane. Now in the brain, it is, as we've talked about previously, it is so vital that they have a constant supply of glucose that these glucose transporter channels are constantly open. They do not close and um, they are open to allow this constant movement of glucose from the outside the cell into the, into the blood, sorry, the brain cell, okay? Um, Remembering last year as well that these, these glucose molecules are always going to move from an area of high concentration to low concentration, but because um, glucose is always being used up in the brain, there is always going to be a low concentration of glucose inside the cell, and therefore that will drive this passive movement down the concentration gradient from outside the cell to inside the cell, and so there's no... Um, regulation of these channels needed. They are constantly open and glucose is constantly moving from outside to inside these brain cells. The last thing that's important to note on here, and this will become apparent as we move on to talk about um, glucose transport into muscle and fat cells, is that um, these regulator, um, sorry, these transport channels within the um, membrane are always there. And so what that means is that they are not up-regulated or down-regulated. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but instead, they are always expressed, they are always present in the membrane of these brain cells. The uptake of glucose is quite different into uh, muscle cells and fat cells. And rather than having these continuously expressed glucose transporter molecules on the plasma membrane, they have a different type of glucose transporter, and this one is called GLUT4. So you are going to become quite familiar with this GLUT4, and you're going to have to be able to talk about it. So do make sure that this um, this is an area that you kind of you can make sense of. Okay. So basically, when um, insulin is absent, instead of being expressed on the surface, instead this GLUT4, which um, <clears throat> you can see just here. Sorry, this picture isn't a good one, but it was it was a nice simple picture. So that's the reason that I chose it. This GLUT4 transporter you can see just down here is the green. The purple is representing a vesicle. Okay, so um, in the absence of insulin, so in other words, when glucose levels are reasonably low before insulin has been released, these GLUT4 transporters are um, basically what we call down-regulated or they are contained within the cell in these vesicles. Therefore, if this was a muscle or a fat cell, it would not be able to transport glucose, even if, even if there was a huge amount of glucose that came along. It cannot do this in the absence of insulin, okay? So when insulin is um, activated by the presence of increased glucose levels in the blood, um, insulin comes along, it binds to this little blue thing here, which is an insulin receptor on the surface of this muscle cell or this fat cell. Now, this means that insulin does not actually travel through into the cell, but instead what it does is it... It, by binding to this receptor, it changes the shape of the inside of the receptor. Then a whole lot of different reactions occur. It's um, kind of what you call an activation pathway or an activation cascade. And by doing so, what will happen is that a whole series of reactions will occur that will signal to this GLUT4 on its vesicle to travel to the plasma membrane where it undergoes a process of exocytosis, 
but because the GLUT4 um, protein channel is in the in the membrane of the vesicle, it ends up joining, so it now becomes on the membrane of the plasma membrane itself on the outside. So this has effectively been what we would call upregulated, and um, it now allows glucose to pass from the outside to the inside of the cell. This diagram shows pretty much the same thing in just a tiny bit more detail, so we'll just talk through it once more because this can be a hard thing to get your head around. So um, here's the first step that happens. So insulin, which is being represented by this yellow circle here, is binding to the insulin receptor, which is on the plasma membrane. So there's the plasma membrane, and that little orangey bit there, or the sort of peachy colored bit, is the insulin receptor. The receptor passes the whole way through the membrane, and there is um, part, of the mem part of the receptor sorry, on the inside of the cell, okay? So this is this cascade I was talking about, the signal transduction cas cascade. Don't worry about that name too much. Basically what it means is simply that a whole lot of different reactions take place and it signals to GLUT4, which is on its vesicle here, that it will undergo exocytosis. Look, your 12's coming in useful. So it undergoes exocytosis and these GLUT4 transporter proteins can now be expressed on the surface of the cell, on the plasma membrane, and therefore glucose will be able to be transported or um, absorbed into the cell, taken up in the cell. Now obviously this diagram is only um, representing two GLUT4 um, transporter proteins being upregulated, but you have to imagine that there are many, many vesicles and there are many GLUT4 transporter proteins on each vesicle. So this whole process is um, massively more complex than you can see on the screen here. Just to emphasize the difference between brain cells and muscle and fat cells, remember in brain cells they have a GLUT, so this glucose transporter protein that is constantly expressed on the surface and glucose is constantly being taken up, whereas muscle and fat cells, because they are not so highly dependent upon glucose, this becomes more of a, a regulation feedback or some kind of um, feedback system where the glucose um, transporter proteins are either upregulated or downregulated as they need to be. Um, the last thing is that when insulin is basically being degraded or decreasing, then this process will reverse and the GLUT4 transporter molecules will then um, undergo downregulation where they will be taken away from the surface again. We're going to run through this process one more time, um, looking at the diagrams in a slightly different way, um, just to kind of, just to run over it again and make sure that it's, it's sort of looking okay to you, okay? So um, this is at the start, this is a muscle cell or a fat cell, so this would be outside the muscle or fat cell and inside the cell. Um, glucose comes along, okay, and even if glucose is at a high concentration and you have this concentration gradient where it's high outside and low inside, the muscle cell or the fat cell is not able to take up that glucose unless insulin is present, okay? So at the moment, um, we've got an insulin receptor over here and the star is indicating that it needs a reaction to take place. Um, and I'll show you that in a second. And then down here, we have this vesicle that has this GLUT4 transporter in the vesicle membrane, and this is the transporter molecule that we require to be upregulated or expressed on the cell surface in order to take up that glucose. Okay, so we can see now that we have a, um, a little red square which is representing insulin, and that has now bound to our insulin receptor. We get this magic um, series of reactions taking place, the signal transduction cascade. That's very biological for you, isn't it? But basically what's happened is that it has sent a signal to our vesicle to go and bind with the plasma membrane or the cell, the outside cell membrane. And so this is this process of exocytosis and you can now see that these GLUT4 transporter proteins are now eventually going to be expressed on the surface of this muscle cell or this fat cell. We can now see that our GLUT4 has been upregulated. It's now being expressed on the surface of this muscle or this fat cell. 
and we can start to see that these little um, molecules of glucose can pass through. Interestingly, and this is definitely extension material, um, they've been shown to look slightly differently once they pass through the inside, and that is because a reaction called phosphorylation happens to these glucose molecules. Um, it's basically just changing the, it's adding phosphate groups onto the glucose and it changes their structure a little bit. But what that does is that it maintains a concentration gradient, okay? So the glucose will continue to move from an area of high concentration to low concentration, even when glucose levels are quite low outside the cell. And so it's a way of getting around the idea that this is not sort of active transport, this is still a passive transport. And by changing the structure or the shape of the glucose molecules once they are inside the cell, it effectively tricks the cell into thinking that it is maintaining a um, concentration gradient in the correct way. Notice too that we've still got insulin being bound up here. As soon as that concentration of insulin decreases, the insulin will come away from this insulin receptor and um, that will reverse this whole process and the GLUT4 transporter molecules will, will go back inside the cell. Okay, so another little quiz at the end of this. I'll quickly read through the questions. You guys pause the video, write down your answers, and then we'll run through them together, okay? So first question is, what is a GLUT? So if I'm, and I'm not talking about your derriere, um, but what's a GLUT, okay? Second question, how do beta cells in the islets of Langerhans release insulin rapidly? And last question, what is different about the glute and brain cells versus muscle or fat cells? Off you go. Okay, the answers. So um, glute is basically a glucose transporter molecule. It is a molecule that is found in the plasma membrane or, or cell membrane. And it is able to transport glucose from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. They do have lots of different numbers. Um, the only one we're specifically going to name is GLUT4. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, the beta cells, they, they make insulin in advance. They store it in vesicles. Um, and these vesicles are going to fuse with the plasma membrane and rapidly release insulin on the... Um, on the activation or by the activation of um, glucose increasing in the blood, so blood glucose increasing. And finally, the difference is that the brain um, glucose transporters are always open, they are always expressed on the membrane, whereas muscle and fat cells require insulin to be present in order to move the transporters from within the cell up to the membrane. And this is this GLUT4 specific glucose transporter that gets upregulated um, in response to the presence of insulin.